Good, good morning here, maybe good afternoon there, depending on when you're re watching this. This is Dr. Baumstark again, uh, and this is Lecture 9. We're going to talk uh, first of all about something called enumerated types, and then we're going to give uh, kind of a general overview and, and introduction to, um, to, con to related concepts called inheritance and interfaces. Um, if you were in, if we were if you were doing this face to face, we would uh, might be doing some exam one review today. Um, but uh, to, we're doing this. We're going to start unit two with with enumerations and uh, inheritance and interfaces. So here is uh, an example to kind of motivate what what goes on with enumerations. We have a constructor for creating a student object, and it takes a name and a major. And right now, the major is listed as a string. And we have to check that if it's null, to throw a new illegal argument exception. We have to check if it's empty to throw a new illegal argument exception. Um, and then we set our name and major. The problem is we can make our major anything. We could make it Bob. We could make it um, stop. We could make it salt or pepper. And all these things are nonsensical values for, for the major. Um, we would like to uh, restrict it to a, um, you know, a reasonable set of values that, that makes sense. But right now, anything that's not empty or null is, is allowed, and, and that gives us some, um, you know, but opens things up a lot. We could put, throw in more if statements to restrict it to specific values, uh, but it turns out there's a better way, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So some, some problems this can throw up. Um, first thing we could do is, is we, we could replace the string with an integer that represents each of the in majors. Um, so we could do an if statement like this to, to do our parameter validation where if the major is less than zero or the major is greater than seven, then we'll throw a new illegal argument exception, blah, blah, blah. Um, the problem here is it becomes difficult to remember which integer goes along with which major. You know, maybe zero is computer science, and one is management information systems, and two is English, and three is chemistry, and so forth. But those can be hard to remember, and that's that's anytime something's hard to remember, that opens us up to programming errors. Also, it's not very readable. It doesn't tell us which one of those are. We can fix that a little bit by um, assigning constants to those things. So in this case, we're making the constant zero be undeclared, the constant one be biology, maybe two is, is, is computer science. But then we get this really complicated um, checking statement where we have to make sure, okay, is the major not undeclared, and it's not biology, and it's not computer science, and it's not chemistry, and, and it gets, gets big and unwieldy very quickly. So we're, we have this idea of, of an enumerated type, um, a data type with a small set of values. Um, these are going to kind of look like strings, but they're not. Um, they, they are basically constants that are a finite set of constants inside of a, of a data type. Um, in most language, languages, they are a list of named integers starting at zero. Um, in fact, in some languages, you can uh, use enums interchangeably with, with integers in certain ways. I'm not sure if we can do that in Java. Um, we, but the long and short is we use this when we need to represent a fixed set of constant values. And here's an example of how we would um, declare an enum. So public enum, the, t the name of the enumeration, uh, here's going to be major with a capital M, curly braces, and inside curly brace, the curly braces are all the possible values it can take. And these are the only values this enumeration type can take. So in general, how do we declare it? Uh, public, followed by the keyword enum, followed by the name of the enumeration, curly braces with all the values separated by constants. Uh, by convention, oops, sorry. By convention, we capitalize the constants inside of an enumeration uh, because we tend to use them similar to, to how we use uh, 
more traditional constants that we've, we've defined in, in Java. So here's our example. Uh, public enum day is the name of the type. And we have our curly braces and hey, there's their days of the week. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Now the day is a data type we can use in our code. And we get a lot of advantages from that as we'll see. So here we have our, our day enumeration type again. We can declare a variable of type day. So type is day, variable is today. And we can assign to it one of the enumeration values. So we take our today variable, we assign to it day.wednesday. So the name of the enumeration dot the um, enumerated value inside it. Um, we cannot assign other values to it. So today cannot be assigned to an integer. We can't compare that to an integer. We can't assign a string to it. As it says, these are illegal and will not compile. And that's a bonus. That gives us type safety um, with, uh, with our, our variables and our, and our values. Um, and that helps us avoid programming errors that would be introduced by doing things like this. Be cautious. Other languages will allow you to do stuff like this. Um, if memory serves, uh, C would let you do this because enumerations in C, uh, again, if I'm remembering correctly, are constants. Um, Java is, is stricter, um, and I think that's a good thing, uh, that it will not allow us to deal with, with, with uh, to use integers and enumerations inter interchangeably. So, digging a little deeper, in Java, the uh, enum type is a special kind of class, and it extends a class Java Lang uh, enum. Um, it can have fields, it can have methods, um, and sometimes it's even, oops, got a different mouse that's a little, little twitchy on the, the trackpad surface. Um, enum can have fields and methods, just like a class, um, and a enum declaration is often placed inside a class if its values are only used within that class. Um, you can iterate over the values of a num type using our for each loop. So for example, for day, current day, in our list of values from day, we can do a system printout and say the current day is, um, well, say it just prints out the current days with space between them here. Uh, and we do something like that. And the values are given to us um, exactly as they are written in the enumeration. Um, advantages here. A variable of the enumeration type can only have one of the defined values. So we can't try to assign something outside that range of values. It gives us type checking by the compiler. Um, that way the type errors can be caught at compile time instead of runtime, giving us safer code. Um, for, kind of implicit in this for you as a programmer is it eliminates the need for a lot of those um, if statements for catching illegal argument exception type errors. Uh, the compiler is, is going to catch them before the, the program even compiles. Um, and so that's a, that's a big bo bonus in terms of how we write, and it makes our code a lot more readable because there's less code in the end. So they can be very useful things to do. All right. Um, what I would like you to do is pause the the... Video for just a moment. Go to the the sample project for today. Load it up and refactor the student and roster classes to use an enumerated type for the student's major. And here's the list of majors that we're going to to use. So pause now. Go do that, and then I'm going to talk you through it a bit. All right. If we're back, let me pull up my Eclipse. There we go. And we have this roster class. Uh, I think let's go to student first. So student has this string major that we want to get rid of. So let's add a new enumeration. We're going to call it major. We'll leave it public, finish, and in major we're going to have these values. 
but generally I don't like you to um, copy paste stuff like that, but it's okay here. Um, for me, stylistically, I like to put these on separate lines. I think it's easier to read that way. Um, and uh, given that this is a class, it does require a um, class uh, comment. So, um, enumeration of possible majors a student can have. You can also uh, Java doc individual fields within this, um, and they will they will show up in, in the generated um, API code if you want to do that. Um, you definitely should do these if you have um, any or. Um, if you, have, if you have any things in, inside the enum that don't make a lot of sense. Here, you know, they, they look pretty um, straightforward. We might want to document the CS one, just in case somebody doesn't know that that's computer science, right? Um, so we can put individual Java docs in front of uh, each one of these. All right, so let's refactor our student class to use that. And of course, that throws up some, some exceptions. Um, the first um, thing to note is now we don't have to worry about, well, actually, we do have to worry about a null major. We don't have to worry about it being empty. Uh, oh, sorry, main, those are names. Uh, major, we don't have to worry about it being empty any longer because it can't be empty. It could be null since it is an, an object type. Uh, Notice this also made give me an issue here, so I will change it there. Should have done that first, honestly. And it's now our get major is just return major. And do we have a setter? I think we're good for now. We might get a problem on this dot major. Uh, we'll see how that, that does in a two string later. All right, now let's go fix the errors in roster. It's here. Let's change count students with major to actually take a value of major. And we're doing for students in this.students is student.getMajor. Dot equals major. Oops. Works. And Oops, so there. We're going to increase our count. Now, I think we can use double equals with, with enumerations, but granted, I, I, I don't use them enough that I forget. So you might test that out in your own work. Uh, if in doubt, always use dot equals. I know that that should, should work here. All right, and that threw some issues with demo controller. Let's fix that. So the count students with major no longer takes a string. It takes that, and we'll probably need to import. There we go. And count students with major no longer here doesn't take a string. Also notice we get a nice. Um, Autocomplete with our enumerations. Let's fix these as well. Biology. Oops, not math. Major.cs.
let's run this and see what happens. All right, so well, here's our students in roster, and oh, great, they, um, the two string worked correctly there. Um, so it looks like two string by default will um, give you the, the actual string value of the, uh, of the enumeration. I wasn't sure if that happened, but I, I thought it probably would. Um, it correctly counted our number of computer science students, since so there are two. Correctly counted our number of mathematics students, there are two. Um, and we're, we're good to go. So yeah, we, we factored it properly. So check that against the work that you did um, and, and, make, and see if there were uh, any issues. Uh, actually, while I'm thinking about it, let's check my theory earlier. Um, so I, I knew this would work when we're using dot equals to check to compare the enumerated types. Let's use equals equals and see if that does the same. I think it will. But again, I don't use enumerations enough to, to have that committed to memory. And I believe it did, yeah. So it still properly counted up our computer science and mathematics students. So um, that's safe to use here. I thought it would because enumerations uh, work like constants. Okay, uh, that's it for enumerations. Let's move on to inheritance. So we're going to start out by showing this diagram. We have what's called a class hierarchy in, inside of Java, and uh, other languages will have something similar. Uh, any, any of the object-oriented languages will. Um, shown on here are, are several classes from the Java API you've seen before, um, like integer and double and exception and runtime exception and arithmetic exception. These things are, are arranged into this hierarchy, meaning they have relationships to each other. Everything is ultimately also an object type, and there is a class called object um, in the API. Um, but we can look, as we go down the hierarchy, we go from more general things to more specific things. So a number is also an object. An integer is a specific kind of number, but then of course that's also kind of an object. A long is a specific kind of a number, it's also kind of an object. A double is a specific kind of number, which of course a number is also an object. So very general, more specific. We've seen this with exceptions. Um, an exception, as it turns out, is, is a type of something called a throwable. It's basically anything that can be the uh, that can follow a throw keyword in in Java. Now, throwable, of course, is um, a type of object because everything is a type of object. So, exception we've dealt with general exceptions is a type of throwable. Throwable is a more specific kind of object. But even under exception, we have other kinds as well. Like a runtime exception is the general. Um, type of things like a legal argument exception and a legal state exception, things that uh, are, are generally seen as errors by the programmer. Um, and under runtime exception, we have more specific things like arithmetic exception, which is a divide by zero error. Um, as I said before, a legal argument exception is also part of this. So in the hierarchy, more, more general things are towards the top, more specific things are towards the bottom. So some terminology here, I've already mentioned, the object class is at the top of the class hierarchy. It is the most general class. The farther down we go in the hierarchy, the more specialized we get. So every class has exactly one, what we call, super class. Uh, meaning it is the class immediately above it in the hierarchy. We also call this the parent class or the base class. Um, the only exception here is object, which does not have a superclass. A class can have one or more subclasses, meaning things specialized from it. We also call these child classes or derived classes. So let's pause here. Integer, long, and double are all child classes of number. 
IO exception and runtime exception are child classes of exception. So that's how we think about this. Exception then becomes the parent or superclass of IO exception. It's also the superclass of runtime exception or the parent class. And we're going to use these terms interchangeably, so um, just be, be prepared. Um, a subclass is what we call extended, and we use and that's the the terminology we use primarily in Java. It's also considered to be derived from its superclass. And when we do that, it inherits everything from its parent. So all the methods, all the fields, um, not the constructors, but that's the one exception. Um, it, it, ex it inherits the methods and fields from its parents, but it can only access or call um, those methods that are public or protected. Or fields too, but we usually don't make fields public. So the object class. Any class that's declared without an explicit extends clause, and we'll see what that is in a minute, automatically extends the class object. So um, when we see public class student here, um, there is an implicit that. We don't write it because we don't need to. But that is implicit. Um, by extending class object, we get some common methods. Uh, the one we've dealt with the most is called toString. And uh, by def it has a default implementation that is pretty useless to us. It basically gives us the package the, that class is in, the name of the class, and then this at hexadecimal stuff after, after it, which we call the hash code of the object. Um, it also inherits the method equals, which is, returns a Boolean, as well as a few other things. Uh, two string and equals are the ones we, we deal with probably the most. So here is an example of the exception hierarchy, and we looked at this before. Um, exception is the superclass of IO exception. Um, IO exception is the subclass of exception. So IO exception inherits um, everything that an exception has. Because exception has stuff from throwable and object, it inherits those as well. So basically it inherits everything above it in the hierarchy. IO exception is a more specialized version of exception. Um, meaning it might take tweak some of the things it gets from exception, like get message, uh, to be more specific to IO exception. An object of a class has the type of all superclasses above it in the class hierarchy. Hence, a variable of a superclass type can reference an object of that class and anything that it subclasses. We call this polymorphism. And this is one of those things that blows my head open every time I think about it. So you're used to seeing stuff like this. We have a variable named exception. It is of type exception. And we're assigning to it a new exception object. So far, so good. The type on the right matches the type on the left. But when, inher it, when inheritance comes into play, we can break that rule in limited situations. In this next line, we still have something of, a, of type exception on the left, but we're assigning to it a new IO exception object. And that's allowed because IO exception inherits from exception. We can do the same thing with EOF exception because EOF exception inherits from IO exception, which inherits from exception. Effectively, EOF exception is also a kind of exception. And so we're allowed to do this. Even though the type on the left and the type on the right don't match exactly, because this thing is also a type of this thing, it works. And we can use something like this, an EOF exception, anywhere an exception is expected. And that's a, we can do some really powerful things with that, as we'll see as we go along. In general, inheritance is a relationship between a more general class and a more specialized class. Um, the subclass can use all the data members and methods um, based on the accessibility modifiers. Um, we can actually rewrite methods from the parent in the, in the child 
by using something called override. And, when, and it, basically the, that overridden method will be used uh, whenever the actual type of an object is that child, class, child type. We can also add new data members and methods in the child if we want to. Inheritance is used as a, if a class is a specialization of another class, and the, both the super and subclass are very closely related. Um, the, the big punchline here is it allows us to reuse code. Um, it's, it's, one of the more, it's another tool uh, in our toolbox to avoid violations of the don't repeat yourself a principle. Um, if a class has most of what we need to accomplish a task, but not everything. We can avoid rewriting that class entirely um, by subclassing it, creating a child class, and then just adding on the additional things we need. Uh, and again, this helps us avoid uh, the don't repeat yourself violations. Okay, so before we look at uh, how we, we do the, the, this inheritance in Java code, let's talk a minute about something called UML diagrams. Um, we, you, you may have seen uh, your instructors using this, these things a little bit before, especially in CS1, um, informally. Now we're going to give you a little more formal um, uh, you know, explanation of what these are. UML stands for the Unified Modeling Language. It is not a programming language, but it is a formal way to write diagrams that describe object-oriented uh, concepts. And there's more, more to UML than that, but we're just going to focus on, on these class diagrams. Uh, oops, sorry. Again, twitchy, twitchy mouse finger there. Uh, so with keeping in mind the things that we've talked about already, every class has a superclass except object. Uh, subclasses inherit the fields and public methods from their superclass. Subclasses can also have their own additional fields and methods. Uh, we can use a UML class diagram to illustrate these. So for starters, let's see what a single class looks like. So on the left, we have some Java code, a class shape. It has a color. It, ha it's, it has a Boolean to say whether it's a filled shape or not. It has a, constructor, a couple of constructors. Um, it has a get color, set color method. Oops has an isFilled method and a setFilled method. We can represent all of that like this. Area that tells me what the name of the class is. We have an area for the uh, attributes or the, the fields of the class. Then we have an area for the methods and constructors of the class. Sorry about the, there was a little bit of a jump in the, in the video. Uh, somebody knocked on my door and I had to, had to talk with them. Um, so we were talking about uh, UML diagrams, and uh, again, on the left, we have um, some Java code that um, we have some fields, we have uh, a couple constructors, and we have some methods. And we can organize those into this diagram that um, gives us a high-level view of, of what that class is and what it has in it. So, Oftentimes, you're going to be given a UML diagram and asked to interpret that um, and even make code from that. In fact, you're, we'll have a lab where we'll give you the UML and you must write the code based on that. The top box, or section of the box is the name of the class, so it should be capitalized. It would be directly, uh, you would directly correlate to the, the, what follows the word class in, in your Java code. The second box is where our fields go. Now, UML calls them attributes, uh, but we, we refer to them as fields or data members. And we write them kind of reversed from Java. We write the name of the, uh, the field first, followed by its type. So in Java, this was string color. In UML, it's color, colon, string. And in front of it will be a plus or minus. The minus indicates that it is a private uh, field or method. In the bottom, we have methods. And just like we had minus for private, we have plus for a, a public field or method. 
Um, if we do protected, we would use uh, the hash mark or the pound sign. So all of our methods go in here as well as our, our constructors. So we have a listing for our constructor there. Uh, we have a second constructor that has two parameters. Notice we do the parameters just like we do, um, do fields. Uh, the name of the parameter is first, colon, the type. And so we have all of those kind of, uh, following it. If a method has a return value, the return type follows the method. So get color return string. So we write it as get color colon string. Now we can represent um, class relationships with inheritance using UML. So say we have object here class object, of course it has a clone method, as an equals method, as a two string, and some other stuff. That's what the dot 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 means. Here we have a throwable. Well, in the, in the hierarchy, oops, throwable um, extends object. We use this kind of error, uh, so this kind of arrow, sorry, um, to say that throwable is derived from object, or throwable is a kind of object. And to be very clear, the arrow must have an open triangle at the end. Not any arrow, arrow will do. It must be an open triangle. And the, the triangle must point to the parent. So when we do this, we say throwable inherits from object, meaning it gets all of the things that object has. It gets a clone method. It gets an equals method. It gets a two-string method. Throwable also adds in a get method, message method, a print stack trace method, and a two, and we write to string here to say that it overrides to string from the parent. So in the, as an example, circles and rectangles. Circles and rectangles are both kinds of shape. Uh, they can be drawn with a particular color, they can be drawn filled or unfilled. Those are common things that that both circles and rectangles can do. Um, they have different properties. A circle has a radius, but a rectangle has a height and width. We, we know this. We've all taken geometry. Inheritance lets us take the shared stuff and put that in a superclass, in this case shape, and let circle and rectangle define their own specific stuff. So we'll put that in, in, in the shared class, in the shared uh, parent, and then circle will have its own radius, a rectangle will have its own height and width. Very classic example of inheritance. So it might look something like this. So a generic shape has a color. Right now it's going to be a string, um, and it is either filled or unfilled, and we're going to represent that with a Boolean. So it might have a, a, a couple constructors, one that gives it a color, one that tells whether it's filled or not. Uh, we might have getters and setters for the color, getters and setters for the filled, as well as a specific two-string here. Circle could inherit from shape and adds in its radius. And we may even have a special, its own constructor that lets us define the radius in addition to the color and whether it's filled or not. We'll add in a get radius and set radius. Um, we'll add in a compute air area that returns double. We'll add in a two-string. Our rectangle also will inherit from shape. It will get a width and a height. It'll have its own set of constructors. Notice it's adding, it, has, it creates a constructor with a width and a height as well as the color and the filled from the shape. It's getters and setters for the width and height. Um, has its own compute area, has its own version of two string that it overrides. So how do we do this? Um, in actual Java code. Um, first of all, we put the shared data members and behavior in the superclass, and then we have the subclasses subcla inherit from the shape by extending it. Formally in Java, that means we do something like, oops, hey, this mouse, public class circle extends shape. So the subclass circle extends the superclass shape. We can only extend one thing. So we don't have multiple inheritance in Java. Each class can only extend one other, uh, one other class. 
So here's what um, shape might look like. Uh, we have our private um, fields for color and Boolean. And notice we've actually switched over to an actual color uh, type here. Um, we have a default uh, implementation of sh uh, a default uh, setup of shape where our, our constructor takes no parameters. We're going to say that it's white and it is not filled. Um, we also have a constructor that lets us set the color and whether or not it's filled. And down here we, we have the, the methods which we're leaving out the, the details of those. Now we're going to do we're going to have um, circle extend shape. So public class circle extends shape. It inherits its uh, its fields, the color and field, but it cannot access them directly. Do not redeclare them. It still has them. It just can't uh, access them directly. If we want to access those fields, we call the getters from the the parent class. Uh, somehow, our, something's got cut off here. It looks like. Is there something there? Aha! There was some weird uh, uh, object there. There's another one. Some stuff in there. There we go. So our circle adds in a radius, um, and its constructor sets a radius to zero. Actually, this constructor would not be allowed. Um, we would have to do. I believe. Actually, it's, yeah, that's, that's necessary. If we, do, if we have a constructor, I think we by default have to call, have to call super. Uh, I might be wrong about that, um, but I believe that that is necessary. Um, let's move this down so that we can read some of this stuff. There we go, that makes more sense. So here we're defining a, um, another constructor that takes the radius, the color, and the Boolean. Um, we need this, super, which says call the constructor of the parent, and we're going to pass in um, the color and the, the filled values to that. Super must be the first thing inside um, this constructor. It can't come after other things. Um, and then we can also set our radius here. Um, so super says call the constructor. Uh, again, I'm unsure if it's needed here. Um, whoever made up these notes didn't put it in, but um, I'm going to throw it in there just to be on the safe side. Um, we can also set up our, our get radius and, and set radius things. Um, move this down to where we go. So we can call the, um, the public methods of our superclass um, just uh, internally. Um, we don't have an, an example of doing that here, um, but we can do that if we need to. If you look at the Java API do uh, documentation, it will tell you what, what superclasses exist. So here we're looking at the documentation for print writer. It tells us it, it inherits from writer, which of course inherits from object. Uh, it'll also see this, we'll see this stuff called interfaces here. And we're going to talk about interfaces in a moment. Uh, before we do, let's just back up. We are going to talk more about this stuff later. Um, today is just an in introduction, but we're going to go into more depth with this, um, I think, in the next uh, in the next lecture. So don't, you know, if you don't feel like you've gotten it all yet, that's fine. Uh, we're just showing you kind of the overview here. All right, let's move on to interfaces then. So general idea behind an interface is it's where two systems meet and interact. So there is an interface between um, two things. So a classic example is um, an electrical plug. It, and the electrical plug is the interface between the power grid, which comes into your house via these plugs and supplies power, and the device that you're running. Um, you know, here in the United States, uh, most of our residential uh, power wiring looks like this. You have a plug with two or, or three prongs, and it can interface with a two or three prong plug that looks looks like this. Um, 
different different countries and even different standards within the United States will have different kinds of plugs. And those are, those exist so that um, incompatible power types aren't plugged in together. Um, it's, a, it's a safety measure. And we're going to be doing something kind of similar with, um, with, with Java. So um, an interface looks kind of like a class, but it's a class where the methods aren't implemented yet. An interface is a way to tell a class it must implement a certain set of methods. We call that um, its signature. Um, by doing so, our, our class can act like the interface type. Uh, and some functionality in Java uh, requires that classes behave a certain way. In other words, they implement a certain interface uh, to work. And we're going to look at some examples here. Uh, the first, uh, so we, we talked about this try with resource um, uh, construct when we looked at uh, you know, the, the try catch blocks. Try with resource closes the object that it creates in the parentheses. So we have something like try, we're creating a new print writer inside its parentheses. That's something that needs to be closed uh, uh, whether or not the uh, exception is caught. So as long as what's inside of here implements the closable interface, try can do that automatically. And print writer and scanner are both things that implement closable. And you can, do that. you can look through the APIs to get that. Another one is called comparable. <clears throat> Let's say we have a bunch of, of elements in an array list, and the list is called my list. The collections class has a method called sort. So collections.sort, we can pass a list to it. Well, how does it know how to sort those things? If they're numbers, we have a, have a sense. Um, if they're strings, we maybe have a sense, but if they're animals, how do we sort things of class animals? Um, what we do is we have our animals class implement the comparable interface. And by doing so, we're uh, telling animals how they uh, compare to each other. You know, what does it mean for one animal to be greater than another or less than another or something like that? And, you know, maybe it may not make sense for animals, but things we do, we want to come up with some idea of how they order them. With shapes, we may decide we want to order them by their area. You know, larger, larger area is greater than something with a smaller area. And we can do that with comparable. Um, integer, double, and string all, all implement com comparable by default. Um, we're used to being able to iterate over things using a for each loop. For that to work, the uh, thing in the for each loop here must implement the iterable interface, and ArrayList does so. All right, so what does all that mean? All this was an introduction to these higher, these more advanced uh, object-oriented concepts of inheritance and, and interfaces. The rest of this unit will focus on inheritance. It will focus on something called abstract classes and methods, method overriding, polymorphism, uh, dynamic binding, and interfaces. Um, and these are what really let us bring out the power of object-oriented development. So uh, today's class, we talked about enums in, in some depth. And we introduced you to inheritance and interfaces and class diagrams. Uh, the next time you're going to hear more about inheritance, in particular, how do we implement super and subclasses. Uh, as always, uh, if you have questions about this stuff, let me or uh, your instructor uh, know.